Theme parks have always offered incredible experiences and full immersion into worlds far beyond our everyday lives. Yet, how did these magical places come to be? And what's on the horizon for the future of themed entertainment? So, let us journey to the past, to the gates of history's greatest theme parks, to see how far we've come and where we're headed. It seems as if theme parks or amusement parks have always existed in one way or another. Yet, we can trace how the popular theme parks came to be with the rise of public parks. One of these was the Vauxhall Gardens. By the 18th century, London was a crowded city. Many of its inhabitants looked for opportunities of escapism. Taking advantage of this trend, Vauxhall Gardens would come to be. Located on the other side of the Thames River, it required visitors to escape the modern world via boat. Once on the other bank of the river, visitors would be welcomed into a world of dreams. Vauxhall offered live music and detailed landscaping, providing a somewhat new and unique experience. As London was becoming more crowded and industrial, Vauxhall offered a sense of escapism to its patrons. Meanwhile, in the Russian Empire, a trend emerged that would forever change the landscape of amusement. Sliding down tall hills had been a tradition for generations. But what if this could be enhanced, transformed into something even more exciting? By creating artificial hills crafted from sturdy wooden structures, they were able to create a more thrilling experience. However, there was one major downside. These attractions required ice to run, so they were not functional during summertime. Well, the Russians would find a solution to that. By using wheel carts instead of sleighs, the Russians were able to create what many consider to be the first roller coaster. This ride was quite simple. It required its visitors to ascend a large structure. Once at the top, they would enter the carts. The carts would then coast downhill in an experience never before seen. As this idea became more popular, it would spread to France, in what became known as Montagne Russe, or Russian coasters. Fairs also played a role in the rise of theme parks. Fairs up to this time had been held for centuries and in different forms. However, with the advent of industrial technology, we would see the rise of industrial expositions that showcased new inventions and products to the world. In the late 18th century France, we would see the Exposition des Produits Industrie Française. One of the most notable of these events was the great exposition of the works of industry of all nations, housed within the impressive Crystal Palace. It demonstrated to the world that the power of industrial technology was a force to be reckoned. For a while, these fans were usually held in a single massive building or pavilion. But as they grew larger, the program would be separated into different pavilions, often recreating the architecture of different countries such as the Exposition Universelle from 1878. However, perhaps the most significant exposition in relation to theme parks was the 1893 World's Columbia Exposition. One of the most iconic features of this fair was the original Ferris wheel. Designed by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr., it stood at an impressive 264 feet. It was a marvel of engineering and provided breathtaking views of the fairgrounds and the polluted Chicago skyline. Another transformative element of the 1893 exposition was the Midway Plaisance, a lively promenade that featured a variety of entertainment options including games, food, stalls and performances. This concept of a Midway became a staple at future fairs and laid the groundwork for the design of many amusement parks to come. Throughout the existence of themed entertainment, we can spot five main influences on the genre. World's fairs or fairs, recreational parks, pop culture and of course, when something becomes successful, we have the copycats. These five elements would at times be connected with one another and at other times completely disconnected. One of the first parks to bring these elements together would be Tivoli Gardens, as Tivoli had different distinct areas with distinct themes. Some of these took influence from World's Fairs. Allowing you to explore exotic locales, Tivoli was also influenced by recreational parks, 
with a lot of attention being put on its landscaping. Tivoli Gardens offered a unique experience of escapism. It even featured a roller coaster that went through a decorated artificial mountain. As such, Tivoli Gardens is considered to be the very first theme park. Meanwhile, we'll do see the rise of pier and boardwalk parks. These would pop up near the coasts of popular beaches. Many amusement parks of Coney Island, like Luna Park, are a great example of this. These parks not only attracted visitors to this bustling coastal destination, but also provided thrilling experiences. With their rising popularity, the concept of dark rides became, began to take shape, adding an exciting new dimension to amusement parks by providing proto-immersive themes. In the United Kingdom, we had Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which is surprisingly still operational. The United States would also see the rise of trolley parks, usually located at the end of cable car lines. These parks would provide the different transportation companies with additional stream of income. We would see many amusement parks taking the inspiration from the Chicago World's Fair, the so-called electric parks, which embraced the vibrant atmosphere of the fair. These parks incorporated stunning popcorn lights. However, it all came down with the Great Depression. The post-war era would bring a new age of theme parks. We would start to see that in Europe and the United States. For instance, the Netherlands would see the Efteling. The Efteling was a park that combined both elements of pop culture in traditional fairy tales and recreational parks. As all of this happened, a man named Walt Disney had a vision. He grew an empire out of animated motion pictures. Pinpointing the exact date the concept of Disneyland came to be can be hard. However, you can see many ideas for what became Disneyland in the original Mickey Mouse Park. Walt Disney first thought of building his park on a strip of land across Riverside Drive from the Disney Studio in Burbank. The design of the park highlighted different aspects of American history. The train was an instrumental part in the original concepts for Walt's park. This was likely due to his connection with the railways at a young age. The park would also feature a sprawling river that worked like a moat. It would also accommodate steam ships. In the middle of it all would be a traditional American town. The layout of the park worked like a medieval fortress. The train would work as a burn, protecting the park from the outside world, and the river would work like a moat. Landscaping and recreation would also play a part at the original concept, highlighting the link between what would be Disneyland and recreational parks. Mickey Mouse Park would never happen. However, Walt's ambition grew larger. Imagine walking into a happy place, a place where you leave this world and enter one of fantasy, adventure and discovery, a place dedicated to the dreams and the hard facts that created America, a place that hoped to create joy for all those that enter its gates. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. When we take a look at the general layout of Disneyland, we see that it is the realization of the ideal Renaissance city. With a hub in the middle, the park followed a somewhat symmetrical layout. Each path took you into a different land. Back in 1955, each land was isolated. To go between lands, you would need to return to the hub. One side featured a massive sprawling river, the Rivers of America, playing homage to America's past. We see here both elements of nostalgia and pop culture. Adventureland would be a romanticized vision of the exotic lands. At the time when decolonization was unfolding, Adventureland would bring guests back in time to when Europeans started exploring other lands afar. Main Street is theoretically similar to electric parks, yet it pays homage to a type of development that almost became extinct in America by the time Disneyland opened. Main Street stood as a reminder of great American cities that were now dying. With many influences from different World's Fairs, specifically the New York World's Fair from 1939, Tomorrowland represented a spirit of optimism that was very much alive back then. The corner of the park would balance out the rivers of America over the years. This part would be the one to change the most, with the opening of the Matterhorn, the submarine voyage and the monorail. Tomorrowland needed to be constantly reimagined, a problem we still see to this day. 
Between Tomorrowland and Fantasyland stood a vacuum that would not be filled until 1959. Originally, this space could have been a Lilliputian land. Well, this idea became the storybook circus, but now as part of Fantasyland. Anchored by the Sleeping Beauty Castle, Fantasyland would be home to the different fairy tales Disney adapted into animated films. Disneyland was the embodiment of the American way of life. It represented the vision of what America was and what it should be. Another factor that would play into the success of Disneyland was the very people that worked in its development. Many architects, artists and animators came over to help build and design this park. Here we see a crucial element. Many of these people came from the art of theater and set design. Perhaps Disneyland is the best show ever played on a walking stage. A number of factors played into the rise of Disneyland. First was the economic boom of the post-war era, raising the standard of living for many families and allowing them to dispose their money at pleasure parks. The rise of Walt Disney Studios gave Disney the advertisement it needed. Walt Disney could televised to the entire nation the concept of Disneyland. But most importantly, Disneyland was unlike any other place on planet Earth. A fair, an amusement park, an exhibition, a city from Arabian Nights, a metropolis from the future, Disneyland had it all. As Disneyland would continue to expand adding new attractions and even new lands, we find ourselves seeing the deep connection between theme parks and world's fairs as Walt Disney would help create several pavilions for the 1964 World's Fair. This included a show celebrating Abraham Lincoln's legacy, a rotating theater to showcase man's progress through electrical appliances, a prehistorical journey sponsored by Ford, and last but not least, a boat flume ride that brought a message of world peace. But Disneyland would not be alone in this World's Fair. Aero developments would showcase their design for a log flume ride. Once again, we see the deep connection between the two genres. After the World's Fair ended, Walt Disney would continue expanding Disneyland, adding the New Orleans Square, which was a massive immersive land. But Walt Disney was an ambitious man. Was an ambitious man. He built a studio, he built a company, and now he had built a massive theme park. But he had bigger plans. Epcot was originally more than a park, it was a dream. Walt Disney thought of a massive city at the intersection of imagination and technology. At Epcot, guests could learn about the latest developments in technology. The icon of this massive project would have been a large mixed-use complex, with a cosmopolitan hotel in the middle, envisioned to house a micro-city within a building, something like an international shopping center. Transportation was also a major part of Walt's original project, with monorails and people movers taking where you needed to go. Epcot was ambitious, unfortunately, Walt Disney passed away. The dream of Epcot would live on, however. Roy Disney, despite the numerous challenges, went forward with Disney World and opened the Magic Kingdom in 1971. However, at this point, the dream of a utopia was dead. With the student's revolution of 1968, the ideas of a perfectly master-planned community became a thing of the past. Ideas of urban renewal were slowly phased out. Yet, in the background, we saw slowly the transformation of Epcot from a city to a theme park. This theme park would later be comprised of two parts. Epcot would be a permanent world's fair. Architect Arata Isozaki compares Epcot with Expo 70 in Osaka. Like Epcot, Expo 70 appeared to sustain faith in modernity as progress. A strain of utopianism, however, much exposed to the critique of current sightings with 1968 survive in it. But still, Epcot would be a place for inspiration, where people of all ages would not only be entertained, but also educated, strive to inspire its visitors. From the latest technologies to a glimpse into the future, Epcot Center opened in 1982. In its first decade of operation, Epcot was incredibly innovative. The park featured outstanding rides with incredible set dressing and storytelling. Epcot Center, on its first 10 years, was a work of art. 
a large part of what made Epcot so incredible when it opened were the themes that each attraction had, whether it was communication or imagination. Each ride brought you on a journey of discovery and awareness. Sure, it wasn't perfect, however Epcot did accomplish what it set out to do, entertain, inform and inspire. A great example of this is Horizons, a ride that opened in 1983 and brought you into a journey of the future. It wasn't just a utopic vision into a fantasy world, it was a ride about what man can accomplish when we dream about the future. Instead of visiting the world from a bird's eye point of view, you saw it from the perspective of a family, experiencing everyday life, from a big city to outer space. It wasn't a ride about predictions, but a ride about how we can shape the future together, because if we can dream it, we can do it. Unfortunately, since the theme park was so great at the start, the park would slowly lose its quality. You see, Epcot was envisioned as a park that would be forever changing, with updates every 10 years. Ironically, it was this strive for forever progress that eventually brought the park down. In its second phase, Epcot tried to appeal to a larger audience with Ellen's Energy Adventure and Captain EO. Innovations was a bad use of the space it went into, with blacked out windows and a space that looked more like a tech convention than a theme park experience. This removed the incredible views of the pavilions from the space. The worst case of this revamp was Journey into Your Imagination, which was a complete train wreck of a ride and an absolute joke overhaul. We can see that Disney ended up doing the opposite of what they have always been good at. They built forever timeless attractions, but with Epcot's ambitions of being the theme park of the future, well, the park to suffer from the worst of postmodernism and ended up with an identity crisis. Should it be about the future or should it be about today? There were attempts to make Epcot timeless, like Discoveryland at Disneyland Paris. However, this never happened. So how should Epcot evolve? What should it look like? That was the question Disney had to answer. In 2017, we saw the first steps to renovate and reimagine Epcot. The park would replace Ellen's Energy Adventure with Guardians of the Galaxy and introduce Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. The park would strive to be more family, more timeless and more Disney. A direct response to many of the criticism the park got. In 2019, we got more details and designs that would never see the light of day. It is at this moment when we notice an interesting phenomenon in theme park design theory. The decision to undertake massive park renovations as seen with Epcot, Disney's California Adventure and Disney's Hollywood Studios possesses significant challenges. These large-scale projects necessitate closing of substantial areas of the park for extended periods, disrupting the guest experience and creating a sense of unfinished business. Disney California Adventure and Hollywood Studios both underwent significant overhauls, resulting in parks that look and feel completely different from their original iterations. While these renovations introduced popular attractions and did fix some of the problems of the parks, they also led to identity crisis, with the parks struggling to find a cohesive theme. Europa Park would be the dream of the Mack family. They had for generations been building wagons. But more recently, they entered the world of roller coasters and amusement park rides. They would strive to build a park in Rust, Germany, right next to the French border. This park would symbolize peace between the various European countries and also serve as a way to test and promote Mack rides. As Europa Park would evolve, you'd start to see there were many similarities to the Disney parks. Eurosat looks just like Spaceship Earth. The park would feature its own versions of Small World, Piccolo Mundo, Pirates of the Caribbean, Pirates in Batavia and even Universe of Energy. Over the years, most of these rides saw rethemes to differentiate themselves from Disney. This goes to show that in the world of theme parks, innovation is what really matters. As Europa Park would now evolve over the years and open highly immersive new areas and attractions. And is now a world-renowned resort, featuring immersive attractions and different lands themed to the various European countries. While remnants of the Disney influence can still be experienced to this day, it's clear Europa Park found its spot in the sunlight. However, this clear inspiration from Disney 
wasn't just an Europa Park issue. In fact, many parks over the years have taken clear inference from Disney attractions. Have you ever dreamed of stepping into the screens of your favorite movies, walking through iconic film sets and seeing how the magic of Hollywood is made? What if you could stand face to face with iconic characters and experience the thrill of blockbuster films firsthand? For a while, studio themed parks like MGM Studios or Universal Studios Florida seemed like the next big thing, captivating millions with their unique blend of entertainment and movie magic. But nowadays, this vision seems almost extinct. What happened to these once thriving ideas? Why did the studio's parks fall from grace? Our story begins in 1964. Universal decided to do something unexpected. What if they could bring visitors inside their massive movie sets? The Universal Studios glamour trams were born, featuring designs from Harper Goff. There had been previous attempts to create a tour that would allow guests to go behind the scenes, but the glamour trams were a real success. Why? Well, because they did not disrupt the movie production process, but they also allowed for never-before-seen moments for guests. The glamour trams allowed visitors to traverse actual film sets, witnessing firsthand the intersection of fantasy and reality. Universal would slowly build more facilities for guests, from classic scenes of the Bates motels from Psycho to thrilling encounters with the mechanical shark in Jaws. The tour provided unparalleled behind-the-scenes experiences. But there were also some great design choices behind it. The guest facilities were located on the upper lot, and thanks to Hollywood's topography, these areas were separate from the main back lot sections. It was the tram that took you there. By the 80s, they wanted something more ambitious a theme park in Florida. You see, themed studios parks could generate revenue from non-theatrical sources, expanding the viability of popular franchises. So why not bring this to Florida? This would be similar to the studios tour, a Hollywood of the East. Disney would also want to get into the game. They would also build a studios tour in Florida. It seems as if Florida would become the new Hollywood, and there were many advantages to that. First was the amount of real estate, allowing for great sound stages and backlot sets, while Los Angeles was crowded. Florida would also be far from all the problems back home, allowing for some cost savings. But most importantly, Florida was already the vacation kingdom of the United States, with the Magic Kingdom and Epcot. People were already visiting this park, so a studio's tour would add to this extensive program. Disney would enter the game with their creative experience. They would create a fantastical version of Hollywood, one of legend and fame. The Chinese theater would be present, working as the park's icon. A Hollywood Boulevard would act like a main street. There would be a brown derby. It was not just another restaurant. It added to the theme of the park. But Disney did not have a big live-action movie library. Well, at least one that could compete with Universal. So they had to find a partner, and who better than MGM? The Disney MGM Studios was born. The tour would be the star of the park, exiting from what is today the Star Wars Lunch Bay. The tram would take you behind the scenes, featuring a very extensive program when it originally opened. However, this program would be shortened over the years. The park would be designed to keep the gas areas away from the sound stages and backlots. The only way to see these areas in 1989 was via the backstage tour. Like many great Hollywood studios, MGM would feature its own water tower, but with a dizzy spin. The tour would pass through some backlot sets, like Residential Street, which featured many houses for exterior shots. Then, these small streets turned into bustling New York. Originally, this was part of the tour. Guests could also experience Catastrophe Canyon, which was not based on a particular franchise, but did showcase some important practical effects and added a bit of excitement to the tour. The tour would also include many real movie props in the boneyard, everything from Flight of the Navigator to Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Then guests would exit into a break area. Why? Well, because after you disembark the tram, your tour didn't stop here. In fact, there was a second part. While Universal's glamour trams didn't directly take you onto the sound stages, Disney would bring this idea to life. With soundproof windows, guests could glaze onto the production happening below them, or experience how post-production was elevated to the art of cinema. 
then this walking tour would end, with a presentation of Eisner himself. The park also featured a tour through Disney's imagination, with animation. Guests would be able to see real animators working on real productions. Many animators who work here have fond memories of the place. Guests could also embark on the great movie ride. Originally envisioned as an addition to Epcot, this ride showcased the rich history of film. So it became clear MGM wasn't just a thrill park, it was a well-rounded entertainment experience. MGM Studios was designed as a half-day park, something to add to your Disney experience, like River Country for instance. It wasn't originally envisioned as a full park, however, slowly you'll notice that the park started taking over the studio's portion. MGM Studios would open, however, in 1989. It was a smash hit. It brought gas onto a Hollywood that never was, and always will be. However, there was a problem. The park needed more gas areas. Disney would quickly add more attractions to the park, with Star Tours, an expanded version of the groundbreaking attraction, featuring fake sets from indoor outside. Then came the Muppets in 1991, with a 3D show showcasing the Muppets parody 3D technology, and Sunset Boulevard with Tower of Terror in 1994. Meanwhile, Universal was worried that Disney entered the game. How could they compete? Well, by doing what Disney did best. They would produce actual rides. But rethinking this park would not be an easy task. Robert Ward came up with an idea. Why not allow the visitors to step foot onto the back lot? Bob then asked, what would happen if we got rid of the tram? And so Universal Studios Florida would double down on the theme park side, but they still wanted to have a working studio. The designers understood Universal's vision, so this park would showcase the studio side but also feature groundbreaking mega rides based on key moments from the original tram tour. Rides like Earthquake, Confrontation and Jaws were born. Because of that, many attractions utilize a soundstage facade. The park would also combine theme and function. The theme park side would also feature a loop pioneered by legendary theme park designer Randall Duell, with different lands of filming locations on each side. Universal Studios Florida would open in 1990. The park had some problems, I mean, most of the rides were not working, but one success emerged, Nickelodeon Studios. Nick was still a growing brand, as so their partnership with Universal allowed for growth, while entertaining guests with live shows. However, as much as these studios parks were a success with gas, there were some problems, the lack of major productions. Unlike the dreams of many designers and executives, this new Florida studios park had a hard time convincing entire productions to come to Florida. This was made worse by the fact guests were near the sound stages. Some movies and series were filmed, of course, and in the case of MGM and Universal, it became abundantly clear the theme park side was more successful. MGM Studios was always envisioned as a half-day park when it opened. It was accompanied by other experiences like Pleasure Island and Typhoon Lagoon that would fill out the day. Unfortunately, MGM quickly became a victim of its own success, having to expand the park. But Disney and Universal would not be the only ones to enter this business. Warner Brothers thought they could do it too. In 1986, the De Laundry's Entertainment Limited created a studios on the Gold Coast in Australia. This was later purchased by Village Roadshow. They produce and distribute films. However, an idea emerged. What if they could create their own studios park with a partnership with Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers Movie World came to be. This park would be designed by C.V. Wood and would keep most of the studio's area separate from gas. There is a large Main Street area, a stunt show, and areas themed to Warner Brothers characters. The park originally provided a studio's tour, but this is no longer active. However, productions are still thriving in the nearby studios, with many blockbuster movies being shot there. Subsequently, Warner Brothers would open new parks in Germany, today known as Movie Park Germany, and Spain, now known as Parque Warner Madrid. This park showcased how a new phase would emerge in studio park design. Instead of having working studios like at Gold Coast, these newer parks would feature sound stages with attractions, 
working like a film the shadow. These parks aim to invoke the essence of film industry without the operational constraints of working studios. A dark ride could be easily hidden inside a giant studio's building, for instance. Universal Studios would also enter this phase with Universal Studios Japan, as the park integrates themed land and attractions that immerse visitors into cinematic universes. While the park retains the aesthetic elements of a Hollywood studio, it prioritizes immersive experiences over the educational aspects of traditional studio tours. The park did feature some educational rides, like a television tour and animation celebration with Woody Woodpecker, now being substituted with Curious George. But the overall design of Universal Studios Japan blends islands of adventure and Universal Studios Florida, with immersive lands like Jurassic Park and backlot sections in the front of the park, this park created a fun experience for guests. The designers did, however, enhance the generic decorated box of the studio's facades, adding a touch of art modern, bringing in streamlined shapes, creating a more visually interesting area than in previous parks. Universal Studios Japan today is a mega successful park, bringing in millions of visitors. The park once again showcased that the Hollywood theme can work really well. However, as theme parks evolved, so did movie productions. More and more studios started using CGI and green screen technology. This resulted in an almost green set. With the rise of DVD promos and the internet, the aura and intrigue of movie productions, at least from a technical perspective, became more mundane. But what if there was a theme park so bad it removed all hope from the studio theme park genre? Originally envisioned as an European version of MGM Studios, this park would originally feature many similarities to the Orlando counterpart, like a Chinese theater and a backlot. However, there were some upgrades. For instance, the entrance would be covered under a studio's building, and the tram tour traveled throughout the park, below bridges, creating kinetic energy. This is, in my opinion, the ideal tram tour, working almost like a train ride. The park would feature working productions as well, but as we all know, Aero Disney was a massive failure, and so plans for this park were quickly cancelled. But the plans for a Hollywood park came back, Walt Disney Studios Park opened in 2002, and it was a massive failure. Considered to be the worst Disney park, it tried to combine classic Disney charm with the everydayness of a backlot. The problem, most of the production aspects were fake. The park did not feature real production stuff, except for the Disney Channel France. But the back lot was just for show and even featured props from defunct Disney attractions like Horizons. This park did not impress and could be considered as the end of Studios Park. Its failure showcased that a search for quick expansion doesn't always result in profit. To this day, Disney is still trying to fix this park and they want to get away from the bad press of the original park by rebranding it to Adventure World. This is where we enter our next phase in theme park design. Today theme parks have entered a new age, an age where we see more lands based on huge franchises. Learning from the success of the Wizarding World, we have seen this type of experience take over the theme park industry, especially studios parks. MGM, now Hollywood Studios, saw the closure of what remained of its backlot tour this was after decades of neglect and no real productions. By the early 2000s, Disney MGM Studios was in its decadence. With the closure of the walking tour and the end of real production, it seems as if the concept was doomed. I argue the end of the original vision of the park came with the closure of the animation building in 2004 and the loss of real film production there. This was because Disney faced its own challenges in the transition from traditionally hand-drawn animation to CGI. So Hollywood Studios had to change. The park grew more and more, expanding guest facilities with more things to do. Residential Street would be replaced with Lights Motors action. But the biggest change was the addition of Toy Story Land and Galaxy's Edge. It seems as if Disney was more dedicated at creating immersive spaces where guests feel like they stepped into the movies, and Galaxy's Edge is the best example of this. Imagineer Chris Betty said, Our goal was to create a place so authentic, so real, that when our guests step inside, they feel like they are 
in the movie. As so, single IP lands fundamentally reshape the fabric of theme parks by dedicating entire sections to a singular narrative universe. Parks can create deeply immersive experiences that attract dedicated fan bases. However, this approach also presents several critical challenges. On the one hand, single IP lands offer an unprecedented level of thematic cohesion and detail. Visitors are transported into the worlds of their favorite franchises, engaging with characters, environments and storylines in ways previously unimaginable. This level of immersion enhances the emotional connection between the guests and the narrative. This also moves the synergy machine to say so, where companies don't make money only from the box office, but also from merchandising, tickets in sales, food and drinks. By leveraging well-established franchises, parks can ensure a steady stream of visitors eager to engage with beloved characters and settings. However, there are some drawbacks. By focusing intensely on specific franchises, parks may inadvertently limit diversity and variety of experiences on offer. The intense focus on single IPs can lead to saturation and fatigue. As new franchises rise in popularity, the relevance of existing IP lands may wane, necessitating constant updates and reinvestments to maintain their appeal. Moreover, what happens when you don't have a blockbuster franchise? This was the problem the original MGM Studios suffered from. By the early 2000s, Disney was not doing so well at the box office, so it became harder to film attractions to failing properties, I mean, who wants to ride a home on the range ride. Even today, Disney faces this challenge. Bob Iger expressed how they might want to wait to expand the parks, because they might just have the next big movie coming up like Frozen. We can see the cracks in these single IP lands start to show up. So, we can see a lot of factors contributed to the fall studios themed parks, whether it's the complexity of real movie productions or a shifting demand in guest expectations. However, the legacy of studios parks lives on. For instance, Universal Studios still builds parks with a Hollywood aesthetic, but now they feature a lake at the center, like Islands of Adventure, the example is Universal Studios Beijing. While Studios Park might seem long gone and a distant memory in the past, they still impose significant cultural relevance. While most guests don't realize it, some production still happens at Universal Studios Florida. I even recall seeing a commercial on TV and thinking, oh, that's... New York at Universal Orlando. The magic of movies still exists, because movies are a state of mind, and as long as we dream and create fantastical spaces, guests will still want to visit them. Whether these are super immersive lands or a simple show, the success of places like the original Universal Studios Tour in Hollywood showcase how it's still possible to build the studio-style parks, as long as we find a way to blend technology the magic of theme parks. People are still fascinated by Hollywood and American culture, and guests will still dream of visiting this world of glitz and glamour, where we enter this Hollywood that never was, and always will be. Ever wondered why Disneyland Paris stands out as one of the most well-designed Disney parks? This is Frontierland at the Magic Kingdom. It features Big Thunder, a log film ride, soon to be Tiana's bioadventure, and a few shops and restaurants. Big Thunder is located on the corner and somewhat hidden behind Tom Sawyer's Island, which is only accessible via raft. And this is Disneyland Paris Frontierland. Big Thunder is front and center, located in the middle of the lake. The shops are located on one side and the restaurants on the other, creating a captivating, breathtaking view, and that's just the beginning. Phantom Manor creates another focal point in what would be otherwise a dead end, and this pattern is located throughout the whole park. In each land, you see the attention to detail and care that went into everything. Disneyland Paris stands out with incredible design in every land of Park Disneyland. Let's unveil the secrets behind Disneyland Paris exceptional design. One of the most overlooked aspects of theme park design is the entrance. Guests need to come to the park 
somehow. When Disneyland opened in 1955, it had a simple entrance. It was very utilitarian. You know, you get your tickets, you come in, you wait in a big line. You could see the train station, but it's only after you cross it that you do see the castle. Eho Disneyland was set to have a similar entrance. However, an idea emerged. What if the entrance was also a weenie, attracting guests and creating a new icon for the park. But how could this be done? How could a hotel be practically inside the park but still be a hotel with all the amenities that guests want, like pool, bar and restaurants? Well, the hotel is divided in three parts. The reception, which is located on the north side, providing road access and also not visible to guests who are entering the park. This allows for hotel guests to have privacy, despite being one of the most crowded areas in the whole continent. The same idea is also mirrored on the other side. The pool is again hidden, but this hotel is basically inside the park, so wouldn't people want to see the park? And that's where the center comes into play, allowing for incredible views of Main Street. The architecture is Victorian, similar to the Grand Floride, but also features the iconic Mickey Mouse clock, a nod to allow you to know where you're going to. But Disneyland would face a major challenge. Throughout his years as a storyteller, Walt Disney would adapt many classic tales into animation, from Snow White to Cinderella. These were European stories that existed for generations, but now Disneyland was coming to Europe. How could it remain authentically Disney, but adapt to the European market? This was a challenge the Imagineers would face. After years of expansion from building Epcot to MGM Studios, they discovered that great design requires great direction and leadership, and the shape of Disneyland Paris itself was determined by Tony Baxter, Eddie Soto, and Tim Delaney. Let's start with Main Street. Looking at the train station, you immediately notice something different. This doesn't look like a small town train station. With its impressive architecture, it looks like a downtown metro hub, while back in the day, Eddie and his team of Imagineers had a very different idea for Main Street. Instead of being set in the early 1900s, it would be moved to the 20s, an age where Europeans admired America, especially jazz, as America emerged as the dominating world power. As so, electric trains and hidden bars would be present, gasoline vehicles and even gangsters. Unfortunately, these ideas were rejected, but some elements remain. Main Street at Disneyland Paris has a much bigger town vibe. Look at Main Street Motors, for instance, and its big adverts. It doesn't have that small town feel, since Europeans don't have that same nostalgia for towns they never heard of. Main Street gives every building a sense of large scale. I mean, compare the trolley garages. Everything here feels like an expensive movie set, like in Hello Dolly. In fact, both Eddie Soto and Tony Baxter were inspired by the incredible set design in that movie, and Tony was even an extra in that movie. Additionally, Walt Disney Imagineer faced another challenge, the weather snow, rain, and lots of foggy rain. How could they keep the gas dry, but also not ruin the views when the weather is bright? In Tokyo Disneyland, there is a large canopy in World Bazaar, covering the entirety of Main Street, or World Bazaar as it's called, but it has its downsides, mainly the cost. So Imagineers came up with a solution, a system of somewhat hidden walkways that stretch from Main Street all the way to Adventureland and then to Fantasyland to the back of Peter Pan. Main Street features these impressive arcades highlighting what makes this park special. It's attention to detail. Every art piece and every little mechanical invention or historical reference look like it belongs in a museum or art gallery. Meanwhile, Imagineers were working on how to adapt Tomorrowland to the European market. The idea would be to not focus on the future as we imagine it, but as envisioned by great visionaries from Da Vinci to Jules Verne and also George Lucas, Discoveryland was born. Tim Delaney would lead a team of Imagineers to design this land. Immediately when you enter this land, you'll notice how different it is from Tomorrowland. The first building used to be Le Visionarium, a 360 degree show. Unlike others from around the world where the shape of the building is hidden, here, the geometry of the circle is front and center, even featuring a dome on top. One of the highlights is the Hyperion, from island at the top of the world. You can also find the Astro Orbiter. Discoveryland was originally supposed to be anchored by an even bigger modern marvel, Discovery Mountain. 
Unlike Space Mountain, this would not just be a roller coaster, but a full on pavilion featuring multiple attractions. Unfortunately, after being pushed back to 1995, budget only allowed for that roller coaster to be built at the Nautilus. Nevertheless, Space Mountain in Paris is one of the most impressive versions, with its fantastic exterior and canon, giving the land that kinetic energy. So Tim Delaney had a dream, and he never gave up on it. Discovery Land stands out for its impressive design and storytelling. Back in the day, it even made more sense, but with the introduction of new IP, it has made the land a bit weird with Buzz Lightyear. Discovery Land is like a dream where all of your Jules Verne fantasies become reality. It was all possible thanks to great leadership and focus on the guest experience. But perhaps the masterpiece of Disneyland Paris as well the castle. Disneyland Paris is located close to some impressive destinations and many castles. If you look at Cinderella Castle and Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland, you see the inspiration from great European castles like Neuschwanstein. Now, the challenge came, how would an European Disney castle look? Disney is a world of fantasy and imagination, so Imagineers came up with a fantastical out-of-this-world castle that looks straight out of the frames of Sleeping Beauty. Le Chateau de la Belle à Bois Dormant. It's not just impressive from afar, but also up close. Take a look at these small square trees and how they look similar to the ones from the movie. The turrets and windows are also detailed to a point where you will need to use your zoom to actually see the small details, like the snails a personal favorite. The incredible design of Le Chateau de la Belle Bois Dormant was all possible thanks to the incredible work of Tom K. Morris, a great Disney Imagineer. But we also have to address the elephant in the room, or in this case, the dragon. Yes, Disneyland Paris features a dragon inside the castle. This is a great example of storytelling. Fantasyland is equally as detailed. In 1983, Disneyland had remodeled its Fantasyland, removing the old tents that are still present at Walt Disney World's version and making it look like an European village. But Disneyland Paris would look even more impressive. In fact, Fantasyland can be split into different European countries. Peter Pan, Alice and Toad are British. The area near the castle is mostly French. Snow White is German. We also have Italy with the old Fantasia Gelati and Bella Notte. But it's not just the genius geography. Fantasyland is elevated by fantastic landscaping, creating an iconic view basically anywhere. The water flows in a bright blue color. The garden shines with topiaries and flowers. It's like a dream, but real. The detail even goes to the shop's interiors. Fantasyland at Disneyland Paris is a reinvention of a classic. This was possible because Imagineers had a great vision of what they wanted to accomplish and how that fit with the context of European culture. But let's continue this theme of discovery with the next land. Adventureland. Highlighting one of the great things about Disneyland Paris, everything is explorable. There are a bunch of hidden details and places to immerse yourself. You can see this with the Aladdin walkthrough, a place where you can escape the crowds. Another example is Adventure Island. Disneyland Paris doesn't have necessarily a Tom Sawyer Island, so this is basically the equivalent, but Imagineers made the wise decision to allow guests to access it easily via bridges. Adventure Island features many many species to explore, including caverns. But the highlight of Adventureland is Pirates of the Caribbean, which is a far superior version of the Walt Disney World version. Adventureland was also supposed to have a mini Indiana Jones land, but the only thing that became a reality is a budget-friendly roller coaster that is frankly not really that good. The entrance to Adventureland is perfect, focusing on the Middle East. This portal acts as your entrance to this marvelous land, where other things can be found. However, perhaps the centerpiece of Disneyland Paris is Frontierland. If you have ever been to a theme park outside Disneyland Paris in Europe, you'll notice something. Almost all have a western area, so Imagineers knew they had to absolutely top everything else. Frontierland at Magic Kingdom doesn't feel like a complete land. Well, 
that is because something is missing here, Western River Expedition. This was a mega complex featuring many attractions, one of which would be a Wild West version of Pirates of the Caribbean, all housed within this massive structure, Thunder Mesa. Ultimately, this never happened unfortunately. Mark Davis' vision never became a reality. However, the spirit of Thunder Mesa lives on at Disneyland Paris. Frontierland has its entrance themed as a fort, marking a dualism between the settlers and the Native Americans. After this, you are treated by an incredible view of Big Thunder Mount, and the facilities are located on both sides. One side serves as the main retail location, whilst the other serves as food. This allows for both to have more impressive interiors as opposed to Walt Disney World. The restaurants are incredible, featuring detailed interiors, for instance. At the dead end of this road sits an old manor. Imagineers opted for a neat ticket here. Disneyland Paris has no New Orleans Square or Liberty Square, so the natural fit for Haunted Mansion was Frontierland, but this would not just be a simple color switch. Because of the great amount of visitors coming from all over Europe, how would they communicate this is a haunted house without using many translations? Well, they opted to change the name to Phantom Manor and feature our scary exterior. The backstory even connects to Big Thunder Mountain. Phantom Manor from the outside looks like a typical American Victoria house, but what gives away its haunted feel is the use of color. More neutral to dark tones give it a Bates Motel feel, rather than bright yellows or white, typically featured in those houses. Additionally, the brown woods create a sensation as if the paint has chipped off, evoking the sense that this house has been abandoned for a long time. It's details like this that elevate mediocre theme park design, transforming it into greatness. Disneyland Paris is filled with these elements, intricately woven into its design, solidifying its statue as a beacon in theme park design throughout the whole world. But the joy doesn't stop here. Let's go back to Big Thunder. Now, Big Thunder was basically Tony Baxter's baby. Remember that old Thunder Mesa concept? Well, there was supposed to be a runaway mine train roller coaster, which evolved into Big Thunder Mountain. And when planning this new resort, Tony Baxter was going to make this Big Thunder the best one. But how? Well, Big Thunder would be located in the center of Frontierland, creating multiple focal points, what today we call Instagrammable moments. The mountain would also be surrounded by the rivers of the Far West, with the same program as Walt Disney World. Another challenge was how could we get passengers from here to the other side of the lake? Go over? Well, no, because of the riverboat. Well, this is when a challenge becomes fun. Why not go under, creating the best part of the whole ride, elevating theme park design to a new level? Frontierland is not just Big Thunder, there is a whole lot of wilderness here too, featuring one of my favorite parts, the Cowboy Cookout, nice and quiet. Park Disneyland is a masterpiece of theme park design, from the little hidden details to the important creative decisions that resulted in a fantastic park. As Tony Baxter himself said, every land has details upon details. Disneyland Paris is a great case study for theme park designers and architects. All of this because of the great creative leadership from people like Tony Baxter, Eddie Soto, Tim Delaney and Tom K. Morris. But it would not have been possible without the creative help from countless Imagineers and artisans from around Europe. In the midst of this though, came a failure. Despite the dreams of CEO Michael Eisner and the countless Disney executives, the opening of Euro Disney did not go as planned. The number of visitors was below expectation, partially because of a recession and the large capacity of hotels. And for the next years, the resort would be submerged in financial problems, resulting in the cancellation of many plans. This is a harsh but important truth. Even if we do our best, spend countless hours designing and building something, it doesn't mean that thing will go according to plan and become a success. We simply cannot predict the future, yet, just like a ship in the middle of a storm, we must keep sailing, doing our best to keep the ship afloat. Thunder may scare you, high tides, veers of course, but at the end of all of that we see a light. After days the sun finally emerges, we see land. Was it worth it? For a designer, everything is worth it. If his creative mind is big enough, of course. 
As for Disneyland Park, it seems as if the sun finally emerged. Attendance has reached the stuff of dreams, and it seems as if Europeans have embraced Disneyland Paris. However, a challenge remains. Park Disneyland has almost the same number of rides as other Disney parks, Tokyo Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom. Yet it feels as if Disneyland Paris is missing something. That is because the last e-ticket was Space Mountain de la Terra la Luna in 1995. Yet the park lacks a major new ride for everyone to run to in the morning. I mean, safely walk to. Now, what would be this new ride? Where will it be located? The challenge at hand awaits both present and future generations of Imagineers. Are you ready to embrace this challenge? When Universal Studios Florida opened in 1999, it was a hybrid between studios and theme park, but Universal planned to create an entire resort, Universal City Florida. This plan showcased a park to complement Universal Studios Florida, that being Cartoon World. This park would be geared toward younger guests and families, with dynamic cartoons from Looney Tunes to Dr. Seuss and even DC Comics. Some of the park's design was done by the Goddard Group, or Landmark Entertainment, as it was known back then. In order to create such park, Universal needed to reach out to other studios that owned these properties. While much of Cartoon World focused on classic evergreen kids programming, one land stood out a land based on heroes. Yes, Universal originally wanted a DC Comics land for the park. This included Batman and Superman. Most designs were done by the Goddard Group. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers would never partner with Universal, opting for Six Flags instead. However, the biggest change to Islands of Adventure would come from an unexpected place. When the Jurassic Park ride opened in California, it was a smash hit, as so Universal quickly planned a version for Orlando. Should it go next to Back to the Future the ride? Well, maybe no. How about in the new theme park? So the designers had to quickly come up with a new concept for this park. What if you could travel to a world of adventure, a world where dinosaurs roam the land, a world of legends and myths, a world where cartoons come to life? Islands of Adventure was born. The lands or islands would be based on literally media. DC got replaced with Marvel. Comic strips adorned Toon Lagoon, bringing classic J. Ward cartoons to life. Jurassic Park was actually a novel. The Lost Continent brought myths from different places, the Hellenic legend of Poseidon, the diverse tales of Sinbad and the magic of Merlin and dragons. Sue's landing brought the evergreen children's stories to life. Now, let's journey into the park, exploring its secrets and attention to detail. Islands of Adventure features an imposing lighthouse as its icon, featuring a cascading shape that gives a sense of intrigue to visitors. The lighthouse marks the entrance to the park, calling the visitors. This is the call of adventure. Guests enter through a main street-like area called Port of Entry. This land combines architecture from different corners of the world, but focuses more on the vernacular self-made type. One of my favorite details is the windmill. Another classic is the Island of Adventure trading post sign. There are some funnier details like the Open Arms Hotel and the Fire Department that caught fire. These spots also have fun audio cues. Sound is an important element in theme park design. It helps guests feel transported to this fictional environment. After all, hearing is one of our senses, and theme parks tend to play with these different sensory experiences. Another genius design decision was a lake. You see, the park is laid out like a loop, with a lake in the middle. This makes it easier for guests to travel around the park. The original Loop design was first utilized at Six Flags over Texas. The lake gives a glimpse into each land of the park and provides some nice reflections. It also now includes a new focal point, VelociCoaster. But an area most fans overlook is Seuss Landing. Dedicated to these classic kids' books, this land features Seussian architecture, with known straight buildings that look as if they are coming straight out of the book. This was accomplished by using styrofoam for the cladding. Even the palm trees here bend and twist. Circus MacGuffus is a great example, it looks almost like porcelain. 
fragile, but it also looks as if it could fly away in the wind. Another detail are the blue wooden poles that in the story hold up this tent. Universal creative teams also added truffula trees, which are a Dr. Seuss classic. Green Eggs and Ham is another great spot, with a giant ham building and canopies that look like Susian forks. This area near the water is called Snitch Beach, and it's very overlooked by guests, so it's a nice spot to take a break from the trails and observe the snitches. If you want to see more of the land details, you can hop on the high in the sky Sus trolley train ride. It also provides some kinetic energy to the park. This ride was originally going to be Sylvester McMonkey McBean's very unusual driving machines. Another great facade is the cat in the head, with this large, well, I think you know what it is. But the queue of the ride is also great, making you feel as if you entered the pages of the book. However, the ride itself is now like Gloucester, suffering from low maintenance. Another great area is Mac Elligott's pool, so overall Sus Landing breaks away from standard theme park norm, providing no straight lines, and so making you feel as if you entered this strange world. The next island is the Lost Continent. Originally this was a massive land, but it has slowly been shrinking and currently has no attractions. The main event for this land is Mythos, the park's main restaurant, designed by Jordan Moser, who also worked on some cheesecake factories. His style is out of this world, combining different elements from different cultures. The restaurant poetically creates a landscape in its interior, with the pools and the caverns that give the place a sense of exploration. The decor combines elements from Roman and Greek mythology, with forms inspired by Salvador Dali and Jean Cocteau, at least according to the architects themselves. This restaurant is often overlooked, but it does have some very cool details with a dragon in his mouth as a pizza oven. The exterior is also great, featuring a city emerging from stone, with mythological faces. Outside used to be Poseidon's Fury, a massive and impressive show like no other. Unfortunately, it closed forever. But the exterior is still visible. It showcases Poseidon's trident and a hand, indicating this massive colossus-like statue used to be here, at least in story. There is also a small store, the other part of Lost Continent showcases more Arabian influences, with a proper street market. This area has a great ambience to it. There is also a talking fountain, which is always a fun way to get wet. The fountain used to mark the entrance to another defunct experience, Sinbad, Eighth Voyage. The show dared to ask the question, what if there was another Sinbad adventure? And apparently, nobody cared, so it closed. Perhaps the reason most guests visit Islands of Adventure is for the Wizarding World. This land changed the theme park industry forever. To this day, this land surprises millions of guests. But why? When you first enter this land, you are greeted by a large portal. After this, you get this fantastic perspective, with Hogsmeade close to you and a castle far off. This creates an inviting look and a sense of exploration. You feel like you are smaller, as if you are part of something larger. These shops are also much detailed. You can check out the signs and the fun easter eggs. The interiors are a bit small, creating a small town feel. The architecture creates a crooked, unrealistic building, giving a sense of mystery and intrigue, as if this place is truly magical. The buildings look like they are collapsing, so while some theme park fans might disregard the wizarding world because it's too popular, it is filled with a lot of details and important elements that changed the theme park industry forever. Universal also made a genius decision to connect this land with Diagon Alley at the other park with the Hogwarts Express, incentivizing guests to purchase a park-to-park -park ticket. This dynamic strategy allows for both parks to have great attendance. But this land didn't open with the park, it used to be Merlin Woods, part of the Lost Continent. In fact, the Tree Broomsticks restaurant is the same facility as a magical tree. A later addition is Hagrid's Magical Critters Motorbike Adventure. This coaster is simply great. First off is the Church Ruins, that immerse guests into this landscaping. This thrilling coaster combines emotion and immersive storytelling. It is a worthy replacement to Dueling Dragons. Hogwarts Castle features the park's main e-ticket ride. 
that utilizes the KUKA ARM system, bringing magic and invention together. The park's original main island was Jurassic Park. Here guests travel to the fictional Isla Nublar. This is a bigger version of the Hollywood version in California. This land features the boat ride and the Discovery Center, and also Pizza Predatoria, with a very nice sign. But the most recent addition was Velocicoaster. Located at a small site that used to be the Triceratops encounter, this roller coaster winds itself through the land. The coaster takes advantage of the site. It can be divided in two parts. First is the Raptor Pack area, where guests outside can see the coaster cars going by. The coaster passes through rock works and foliage along with some raptor statues. The other part is located near the lake, providing close encounters with the water and the paths. The small problem is that the coaster is themed to Jurassic World in a Jurassic Park land, creating a weird juxtaposition. A small hidden area is Camp Jurassic, which is basically an immersive playground. It creates a diverse landscaping, with caverns and waterfalls. However, a weird land is Coal Island. This site was originally envisioned as a Jurassic Park jeep ride, but now it is themed to the Universal Pictures King Kong movie. This ride utilizes a ride system similar to Fast and Furious Supercharged, but recently it lost 3D and the outside elements making the ride feel less immersive and less worth it. This is a weird land because it just has this ride, as compared to the other islands in the park. The next island is Toon Lagoon. This, alongside with Sus Landing, makes you feel like you entered the cartoon world. Toon Lagoon is the wettest island of all. Dudley Do Right Falls is based on the J-Ward cartoon, and features an interesting design with the mountains in the back with one of the characters having a dynamite on his mouth and a sawmill. It also features an airtime hill after the first drop, creating an interesting twist on the classic log flume formula. Another great area is themed to Popeye. The ride in itself can get you quite wet, but notice the nice cartoony rock work. You can go over the Me Ship Olive. Not only is it fun, but you get this incredible view of the lake. This area is quite nice, offering great views of Velocicoaster and some detailed props. The reason this space feels empty is because there used to be a ride here, the Island Skipper Tours. But Toon Lagoon also has its own street, or should I say, comic strip. This area plays homage to classic comic strips with the architecture of the buildings. Each facade has its own unique, should I say, character. Unfortunately, the area has suffered with one of the stores being turned into a Universal Orlando Annual Pass lounge. Many call this land outdated, but I would argue it's evergreen. Comic strips have been part of our lives for generations. It is an art that we are slowly losing, but I think it has potential. Speaking of that, there is the unused Toon Lagoon Theater. Most of the time it sits empty, utilized during special events and other boring stuff, as so it is precious real estate for future expansion. While Universal originally wanted DC Comics, they eventually ended up with Marvel, before Disney bought Marvel. This land takes its inspiration from the comics themselves. Each building is full of color, and you can see massive character arts throughout the land, from your favorite superheroes. There is even a building that changes color depending on your perspective. The main event here is the world class The Adventures of Spider-Man. This ride is mind-blowing combining practical and 3D effects, as this ride immerses you into the world of the comics. Guests ride a scoop vehicle in the most dangerous night in New York, encountering some classic super villains. The land's other attraction is a B&M lunch coaster. While the coaster doesn't feature much theming, it is quite imposing in the landscaping of the park, creating a nice skyline. But Islands of Adventure continues to evolve, as the park approaches its next decade, we can expect new adventures to come by. From its humble beginnings to global acclaim, the journey of Islands of Adventure is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and the relentless pursuit of excellence. One thing becomes abundantly clear when you look at this park. Greatness is not achieved overnight. It is the result of countless hours of dedication, creativity and passion. Here is to the timeless enchantment of Universal's best theme park. But don't fret, my friends, 
as the adventure lives on. Have you ever wondered why Tokyo Disney stands out with incredible design? This is Tokyo Disney Sea, the best park in the whole world. The entrance to the park is like a real city. It even features a full working hotel. The icon of the park erupts in incredible design. This volcano features a high-tech ride and an immersive land. From outstanding rides to incredible landscapes, there's something about Japanese theme parks that stand out. Let's find out why Japanese theme parks are incredibly well designed. Well, surprisingly, when Tokyo Disneyland opened in 1983, it was in fact not outstanding. In fact, Tokyo Disneyland almost didn't exist. Our story begins when Oriental Land Company was born. Their goal? Reclaim the sea of Urayasu, not only for commercial and residential development, but also for a grand recreational facility. Little did they know, this ordinary concept would lay the foundation for what we know today as Tokyo Disney Resort. This process would however not be easy, it included tiresome hours of negotiation with the government and fishermen. With agreements in place, Oriental Land embarked on a monumental task of offshore reclamation in Urayasu. But an idea emerged, what if this land could be used for a Disneyland park? The 70s were a hard time for Disney, they were focusing on building Epcot, so a rare opportunity emerged. After long and tiresome negotiations, Oriental Disneyland came to be. But how would the park actually look like? Well, Imagineers were busy realizing Walt's dream with Epcot. This massive project required a lot of work. So Oriental Disneyland, now Tokyo Disneyland, would basically just be a copy and paste of Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom with some really questionable decisions. So let's explore Tokyo Disneyland. Let's start with the entrance. Imagineers were faced with a challenge. Because of the weather, they opted for a covered entrance. This was originally going to be themed to different countries and would feature more brutalist aesthetics. However, a more standard main street came to be World Bazaar. This allows for shoppers to seamlessly hop from shop to shop while staying safe from the weather. Additionally came a genius decision. The side streets connect to the other lands for better crowd control. Then the parade would also not flow through World Bazaar, again for better crowd control. But this comes at a price, both financially and aesthetically. The facades look less lively with this green thing standing out. It takes you out of the immersion for an instant. There is also a big positive that I don't see many people talking about. It allows for great landscaping. What do I mean by that? Well, this view of the castle is great. It is what Gordon Cullen calls here and beyond. The park would also feature some weird creative choices. Tomorrowland would feature the classics from Disneyland and Walt Disney World. In fact, Tomorrowland at Tokyo Disneyland feels like a trip back in time, because it is basically the same as Walt Disney World used to be. They made the wise decision to align Space Mountain with the center of Tomorrowland, creating nice viewpoints. The park would also feature a short skyway, leading to Fantasyland, featuring the rides you would expect, like Dumbo, It's a Small World and Haunted Mansion. Wait, what is Haunted Mansion doing right next to It's a Small World? Well, Imagineers thought it would make more cultural sense to put Haunted Mansion in Fantasyland, despite creating some odd viewpoints and contrasting with It's a Small World. After all, Haunted Mansion has its American colonial facade that contrasts with medieval European Fantasyland. Frontierland would also not be called that, rather Westernland but it was still very similar. Adventureland would also feature the classics from Disneyland and Walt Disney World. There would be a New Orleans Square, missing some buildings, Jungle Cruise, Swiss Family Treehouse and a Tiki Room. What would make Tokyo Disneyland different is the railroad. Because of Japanese laws, the railroad would only have one stop and in fact it doesn't run a full loop. Instead, it travels through Adventureland and Westernland. This is Western River Railroad. More on it later. Meanwhile, many have pondered, would a Disney park outside the United States work? After all, this was the first park to be built outside the US, featuring the classic Disney characters. Were these ideas incompatible with other cultures? 
Tokyo Disneyland was a massive success. By 1984, it had welcomed more than 10 million guests. Disney creatives not only learned their designs could work outside the United States, but also their creations impressed Japanese guests, showing the potential the park had. This marked a slow but important shift. 1986 marked the opening of Big Thunder Mountain. By that time, it was the best Big Thunder. In Walt Disney World and Disneyland, Big Thunder is located on the side. It's not an icon of the land when you first enter it. However, at Tokyo Disneyland, Big Thunder Mountain is right at the end of this pathway. But that's not all. Big Thunder features great interaction with the railroad. Look at how the Big Thunder layout communicates with said railroad. And it gets even better. Big Thunder at Tokyo Disneyland features many details that make the ride better. It is very impressive and a testament to good design. This began a trend that over time would become more noticeable. New clones from the US parks looked slightly better than their American counterparts. Let's take a look at Star Tours. It features this massive imposing hangar style building with the walkways and elevated pathways. It creates kinetic energy and gives that sci-fi look. This new expansion in Tomorrowland also saw cooler environments like Pan Galactic Pizza, a great example of creativity and attention to detail. But one of the most impressive clones of a ride is Splash Mountain. First off is the interaction with the railway. It creates a pleasant aesthetic and one of the best views in the whole park. The train creates a captivating look. This composition works well because it features multiple levels but one focal point, with the logs going down the hill. The land is also full of incredible details everywhere you go, making you feel as if you entered the world of these small creatures. Additionally, there's a great restaurant here, Grandma Sarah's Kitchen, with the same elements I described early. So why is Splash Mountain at Tokyo Disneyland such a creative success? Well, because of the attention to detail that went into it, the incredible layers woven into the design that creates great perspectives. By this time, it became clear Tokyo Disneyland was a massive success that would last for generations, so it came time to develop a sequel, a second park. But what would it be? Well, maybe a studios park where you could experience the movies like at Walt Disney World. Well, this idea would evolve into Tokyo Disney Sea. Japan would have its own unique Disney park. Tokyo Disney Resort has an advantage. It's located right next to the sea. So why not take full advantage of that and develop a park about the history, the legends, the myths of how we conquered the seas. Mediterranean Harbor features impressive architecture from all over Italy, telling the story about merchants that set sail to the high seas. It also includes a full working hotel, Miracosta, taking inspiration from Disneyland Hotel in Paris. Miracosta is massive, it encompasses many parts of the land, allowing for different room views. The lobby is mega impressive, featuring artwork depicting the ports of call from the park. This hotel is great because it blends renaissance, Italian culture and Disney theming in a fun way. The incredible design of Tokyo Disney Sea was all possible thanks to the creative lead of creative executives like Steve Kirk and his incredible team. It was perfect timing with great people coming together. Mediterranean Harbor also features great views of Mount Prometheus, a volcano that houses Disney's best land. Mysterious Island, transporting gas into Nemo's hideout. Imagineers integrated special effects to the land with smoke and water effects giving us the illusion that the volcano is very much active. And the boats also pass through giving some good kinetic energy. Tokyo Disney Shi also needs to reinvent the classics. It needs new original rides. Two of these came from Jules Verne ideas. Journey to the center of the earth which reutilizes test track ride system to create a high high-tech thrill ride and 20,000 leagues under the sea, which gives guests the illusion they are underwater, and also to search for treasure with a searchlight, meaning you need to ride this ride multiple times to catch everything. The park is also laid out in a loop, meaning that after you explored every land you have set sail across the seven seas. But the park also features clever shortcuts behind the volcano, solving one of the downsides of loop designs. The park features many ports of call. One of these is Arabian coast, creating captivating compositions with imposing Middle Eastern architecture and small tight streets. This land has a fruitful program featuring carousel, theater and a major boat ride. The 
Park's answer to It's a Small World. Originally, it tried to tell the story of Sinbad, but it was later reworked to make it more friendly to guests, introducing Chun Du, an instant theme park classic. And also Simba lost his beard. The park then invites you into a lost world, a lost river delta that is, featuring Indiana Jones, a clone from Disneyland, telling a different story with Central American culture. The land also features a lot of detail with the boats, the plants, they work together with the architecture to tell a story, as if you are lost in the jungle. Next up is Glacier Bay. Imagineers originally envisioned a port that would be on the cooler side, a mixture of retrofuturismo and glacier expeditions. These plans would later change into port discovery, the Epcot of the seas. The land features a red floor that works like a carpet. It also has great kinetic energy with the railroad, with a smaller but cool detail that many guests don't notice. Look at how the waves are hitting the rocks beneath the railway. Now that's immersion. The architecture is very retro-futuristic, with creative designs that work well. Notice this giant gate that protects the park from the high seas. At least that's what the Imagineers want you to feel, because there is a road right next to it. The land also features a trackless ride, Aquatopia, keep this one in mind for later. American Waterfront features many different themes, from the small New English village with the boats that sway with the waves to the classic lighthouse. This is where you see the other side to American Waterfront, the mega side, from a bustling city to a massive fake cruise liner. This cruise liner, the Columbia, features a restaurant, for instance, but its purpose is more for aesthetics and storytelling. This land features New York. The Columbia allows guests to feel immersed onto that environment. Of course, New York has a massive cruise liner, so the park needs one. In theme parks, sometimes things don't need to have a massive, extensive program. They just need to tell a story. New York is a city of skyscrapers, so Tokyo Disney Sea also needs one. This came after 2001 with Tower of Terror, utilizing a different story. This time, the park creates captivating view that makes sense in a New York environment. The architecture also connects with the story. It features four bricks, something used back in the day to protect the steel structure from fires, but also utilizes exotic elements from around the world connecting to the story of that attraction. Another later addition is Toyville Trolley Park, bringing guests to the good old days of cable car parks. The Toy Story theme is not overt in its aesthetics, that is, it's not in your face. American Waterfront takes full advantage of the elevated railway. This is one of the most immersive parts of the park. It's like you're really in good old New York. The streets, the cars, and even Broadway, they are all there. There's also a mega detailed department store, again, combining American and Japanese cultures. So why does Tokyo Disney Sea succeed in so many levels? Well, because of the attention to detail and storytelling, Imagineers already learned from the creative success of Euro Disneyland. They learned that every land needs to have details upon details, and at Tokyo Disney Sea, everything feels explorable. It's not just about the rides, it's about walking around and traveling to a world of fantasy, adventure and excitement. This makes sense once you realize Tokyo Disney Sea was more focused towards adults. This is the park you go for a date. For that, this incredible composition needs to be more apparent. The restaurants need to have great views. Every land needs great landscaping. It's not just about the use of each facility, it's about what it adds to the overall story of the park. Water follows you throughout, and so does the story. Tokyo Disney Sea is one of those parks, the more you learn about it, the more you enjoy it. It's like Tim Kirk said, the levels of detail and story we were able to build in are truly astonishing. Tokyo Disney Sea works well because it transports you into a different world. Every building adds to the story, that's how immersion works. After the success Disney had in Japan, Universal wasn't going to be unchallenged. They were coming to Japan. Unlike the previous park, there would not be an active movie studios. This would be a full-on park. But how could Universal adapt to cater towards the Japanese audience? This would all be possible thanks to the incredible creative leadership of David Burkhardt, John Bardwell, and Sharon Spencer. Most of their creative decisions can still be seen to this day. First off, you'll notice how the entrance is 
covered just like Tokyo Disneyland, but it also looks great at night. The creative team did a great job creating new facades for these buildings, because here in Japan there are more Hollywood facades, creating a main street-like atmosphere, which is missing from the Florida version. Take a look at the attention to detail. Notice the various architectural styles, Art Nouveau, Spanish Revival and even Art Deco. Just this theater on itself looks impressive. Additionally, at USJ, the studio facades look much more impressive. They have an art modern aesthetic that goes well with the rest of the theme of the park. It solved the problem from previous studios park, where the sound stages were very much function based. Now, the form of the building adds to the theme of the park. Look at the restaurant here, it's not just about the food, it's about Universal's legacy as a company. New York and San Francisco would be basically the same. Sure, the rides are different, but the design was basically the same, with some differences in color. Jurassic Park features different color schemes, much more emphasizing the jungle. When Flying Dinosaur opened, this land became filled with safety nets, unfortunately ruining many landscapes. But it's a good roller coaster, so... In 2024, there is a fun contrast between Water World, which opened with the park, and Super Nintendo World, that came in later, creating a funny view with the apocalyptic aesthetic of Water World and the overall happy aesthetic of Super Nintendo World in the background. Additionally, the park also features its star attraction, Jaws, which still operates. It's a fantastic ride that makes this park even more special. Here, there is this restaurant, which creates a great view of the ride, and now Harry Potter. Yes, Harry Potter and Jaws coexist here. Amity Island is great, with New England-style architecture and many fun details for the fans to enjoy. Storytelling here extends to the whole land. Next comes an unexpected protagonist, Snoopy. Universal Creatives designed an indoor studio that blows the Cedar Fair parks out of the water. It's a great environment for kids. Originally, USJ had a western area, and it made perfect sense with the theme of the park. However, things would change over time. First came Wicked, and then Sesame Street and Hello Kitty. In fact, if you pay attention, you can see some remnants of the Wild West area. But Universal Studios Japan is also about its high-tech rides. From Space Fantasy to Mario Kart, it also features Hollywood Dream, the ride. Even newer additions like Minion Land works really well, because it has a lot of fun, cool elements. And that's why Universal Studios Japan is the most visited Universal Park. But Oriental Land Company would not be unmatched. With the opening of Tokyo Disney Sea, Imagineers felt Tokyo Disneyland could become less relevant. So a new ride would need to be built, but with Disney owning so many famous intellectual properties, which one would they be? Winnie the Pooh. Eddie Soto recalled how challenging it was to work with such an IP. After all, Winnie the Pooh is a story that can feel a bit boring to some. So why not adapt Aquatopia into a high-tech dark ride? Honey Hunt was born. With the trackless ride technology, they were able to create different experiences for each car. But this innovation didn't stop here. Next up came Monsters Inc. Ride and Seek. It would unfortunately see the closure of Meet the World, which was an original show from the park, but it was replaced with a great experience, where guests interact with the flashlight in an incredible environment. Next up would come a renovation of existing lands, maybe a new fantasy land. The park welcomed its newest addition, replacing the Grand Prix Raceway with this massive expansion. We would see a new area in Tomorrowland, a theater and a Beauty and the Beast dark ride. And yet again, Tokyo Disneyland set out to impress everyone. First is a small French village. The way the buildings are laid out creates breathtaking views. The main attraction is a great example of storytelling. The castle, it looks straight out of the movie. The landscapes complement that. And what about the ride itself? It's a combination of two elements, a traditional show and a dark ride. Each area feels like an act from a performance, but you are fully immersed onto that environment with great animatronics and the trackless dark ride system. It's a great example of something Disney has always been good at, staging. The land also includes a theater. It features four mountains to hide technical elements from the building. Tokyo Disney is known for its great shows, so this place is definitely well utilized. Additionally, this expansion would see some upgrades to Tomorrowland, like Happy Ride with Baymax. 
but what really makes Japanese theme park so special, well, I think it's how they set out to do the impossible. It's a perfect combination of outstanding creative decisions like landscaping, architecture and design combining with guest expectations. Japanese theme parks have to cater to a demanding audience that takes notes of the park's incredible design. Guests in Japan, they do more than riding the rides, so the park's leadership needs to create beautiful landscapes and diverse points of view. Theme parks in Japan like USJ and Tokyo Disney Resort are also known for their modest budgets, allowing for a creative sandbox. So it's a combination of great creative teams and commitment to greatness. It's fun to see how the parks evolved all the way from the 80s as a simple Disneyland park that grew into a fantastic resort. It's like a seed that began mid-side the earth. It grew into a blossoming tree. But what's next? Well, Tokyo Disney is again topping what they have done before with a new expansion coming to Tokyo Disney Sea, Fantasy Springs, coming this year. This land will feature immersive experiences from different Disney adventures, Tangled, Peter Pan and Frozen. This land is also going to feature a new hotel at Tokyo Disney Sea, featuring park view rooms. Tokyo Disney Resort does it again. Tokyo Disneyland is also redoing their space model, replacing the current one. This is part of a plan to revamp Tomorrowland. But now we have a different challenge. As theme parks evolve, they welcome new rides and say goodbye to old ones. But now, Universal Studios Japan and Tokyo Disney Resort face a challenge. Where to expand? This is a challenge current and future generations of Imagineers and creatives will have to solve. Are you going to take on this challenge? Universal Orlando is set to unveil its groundbreaking park, Epic Universe, in May 2025. Welcome to Epic Universe, a revolution in the world of theme parks. But what secrets? Lie within this new park, join me as we explore everything you need to know about Epic Universe. Epic Universe is a park of interconnected realms, where every corner brings a new story to life, from the central hub to lands inspired by beloved worlds. Each step pulls you deeper into the adventure, a theme park experience like no other. This diagram of Epic Universe leaves so much out that you can focus on what's truly innovative about this park. One of the most memorable and impressive elements of Epic Universe will be its hub. It actually consists of two interconnected hubs. This will create an expanded perspective, because your view of the space will extend beyond the hub to the Helios Grand Hotel, that will serve as a focal point. These two hubs also mitigate the impressive height of Helios Grand and, with many water features, will create impressive reflections. At the extreme of both circles, we have the main entrance to each land. Each subsequent portal will have an equal opposite. If we see the way they all hang together, these portals form a Greek cross, and they all come together near the constellation carousel. So the carousel becomes more than a standard theme park carousel, it is the coming together of all the cosmos. And Universal Creative is doing a great job here framing this carousel within this diverse space. With the water below, the carousel feels as if it is floating or flying away. The sit-down restaurant will also have incredible vistas. The Atlantic will be out of this world. You can see water plays a vital role in Celestial Park. The water tells its own story, connecting the different vantage points. The story is simple, but effective. It starts out small, near the entrance, but grows until you arrive at the main show, near Helios. Here, each part plays a role. You have this large statue reminiscing about ancient Greek gods and the different legends about the universe. The stairs and path play a role as well, as they themselves become the main visual and spatial connectors. The main entrance will feature these two arcades, with large domes on each side, hosting the main amenities for visitors, protecting them from sunlight and from the weather. At this point, the layout is divided in two, like two giant arms that hold the park together. Think something like Communicor at Epcot or the Vatican, where you have these giant arms with a square in the middle. This shows the clear connection between Baroque architecture and contemporary theme parks like Epic Universe. 
in a similar concept on the opposite side the Heroes Grand Hotel will extend into the park, thus enclosing the space within and blocking the outside world. So let's explore Epic Universe and understand what makes this park so special. Let's start at the entrance. As you stand here, you'll notice this large portal with an arch named the Kronos Tower. You'll notice this large display features constellations, celestial bodies and most importantly, medallions. Soon you'll realize that the planets are aligned, allowing for us to venture into this once-in-a-lifetime experience. you also notice that Universal Creative is reutilizing a trick they learned from Islands of Adventure, and that's to connect every land together in story. Each medallion represents a different world within Epic Universe, How to Train Your Dragon, Super Nintendo World, Dark Universe and Harry Potter, with the large icon being Epic Universe in itself. The first land guess we encounter is Celestial Park. Celestial Park takes many cues from the history of theme parks, as it brings back some elements of recreational parks. The focus here will be on the landscaping, with lush gardens and water as a storytelling device. Near the main axis of Constellation Carousel, you'll find the gateway to a land you might already be familiar with, Super Nintendo World. Surrounded by tall, almost medieval-like fortress, Super Nintendo World requires guests to ascend. This will give us a sense of expectation on what to come. Then we get the big reveal. As we exit Peach's castle, we see Bowser's castle in the distance, serving as a focal point and entrance to the Mario Kart attraction. Before rushing to the queue line, notice the many details around you that you might recognize from the games. Additionally, tall walls disguised as hills or other in-game landscapes protect you from the vistas outside the Mushroom Kingdom. This mini area of Super Nintendo World will feature two attractions, an augmented reality dark ride inspired by Mario Kart and Yoshi's Adventure. Take notice how this land combines different levels, creating a sense as if this world is bigger than you might think. Once downstairs, you'll find another portal that takes guests onto a different world within the Mario universe, Donkey Kong. Contrasting with the Mushroom Kingdom, Donkey Kong Country will feature lush landscaping, making you feel as if you entered a grand tropical rainforest. That's not all, as this mini land will feature perhaps the park's most innovative attraction, Minecart Madness. Guests will hop into a minecart and experience the sensation of jumping the tracks. This is accomplished by hiding the real coaster tracks beneath the fake mine train ones. The coaster will also travel through the Golden Temple, with a main water feature in the middle, giving a dynamic look that makes the temple seem bigger than it actually is. Epic Universe is similar in many ways to opening day Disneyland, in that each land is isolated from each other, as so you have to exit near the same portal you entered and return to Celestial Park. Located at the edge of the main water feature, we see the next major portal, and from the outside you may get a clue as to what this land is about. Dead trees surround the portal and as a pinnacle we have some sort of device that harnesses the power of lightning. Must be an evil experiment from Dr. Frankenstein. Inside this universe we have an eclectic mixture of Central European vernacular architecture, something akin to what you'd see in a horror movie from the 30s. Take note of the layout of the buildings. Instead of symmetrical axial perspective, we have this asymmetrical tight perspective with a focal point at the end. This will be a somewhat replica of Le Chateau Noisy in Belgium. The castle design takes inspiration from neo-gothic architecture, something that's often associated with classic monsters. Inside sits perhaps the park's most ambitious dark ride. Here you enter Victoria Frankenstein's manor and embark on an experience like no other. Utilizing the Kuka Arm ride system premiered in Forbidden Journey, Monsters Unchained, the Frankenstein experiment will feature life-like and scary audio animatronics. These advanced AA figures are a marvel of engineering. Beyond that, Dark Universe will feature a spinning roller coaster, Curse of the Werewolf. Guests will enter the encampment of the Guild of the Mystics, where they will be greeted by Maleva. This encampment seems to be inspired by many Roma cultural elements. 
but perhaps the most impressive element of Dark Universe is not an attraction, but rather an architectural focal point. The Burning Blade Tavern and don't take this concept art as fantasy, as the windmill will be flaming periodically, just like in the movies. Dark Universe serves as an architectural reflection on our fascination with legends and the mythos surrounding monsters, now brought to life. Located on the opposite side of Dark Universe, you'll find another portal, marked by a giant column with a wand-like pinnacle. A time-turner device from the Harry Potter franchise indicates to the audience that we may be traveling to another place at another time. After passing through this portal, we get a review, a replica of Porte Saint-Denis from Paris. This arch marks the entrance to a beautiful boulevard, lined with wall-to-wall -wall buildings. It's clear you are now in Paris. Welcome to the wizarding world of Harry Potter, Ministry of Magic. To create this illusion, Universal Creative followed the footstep of Osman. You see, when Napoleon III rose to power, he wanted to transform Paris, and from 1850 to 1870, much of Paris was remodeled to fit a character of order. Baron Osman made a new plan for the city, opening large avenues at a huge scale. This urban framework can also be found at Epic Universe. You will see tall buildings side by side in a somewhat symmetrical axis. This axis continues forward until it reaches the street and turns lightly and ends. This will create the sensation of a street that goes on forever, just like the avenues of Baron Osman. In the middle of the axis will conveniently sit the entrance to Le Cirque Arcanou. From the outside, the tent seems small and insignificant. But by cleverly hiding the real building behind the tent, Universal Creatives will create a surprise moment once you venture inside. Right next to the circles sits a diagonal that will feature the most impressive view of the land. A magnificent flight of steps sits in front of a replica of Le Sacre Cœur. This is reminiscent of the Scalinata in Rome, as this space is not accessible to guests. The stairs exist to create space not to take you anywhere. Epic Universe will also feature elements from medieval Paris. Notice this hidden plaza and alley in the layout. This one is hidden behind the main facades from the boulevard, creating an experience like no other, as it will make you feel as if you have left the orderly streets of modern Paris and are now transported into this dark hidden alley. In story, this is where you find Le Goblet Noir, where international dark witches and wizards gather to escape the prying eyes of the Paris ministry. On the side we see an alley or Rue Malabette that leads towards the main attraction. The entrance is inspired by this Art Nouveau building, showcasing this beautiful perspective you see here and you see beyond. The buildings are not parallel to each other but instead are at an angle, creating a sense of discovery. Here sits the most impressive attraction in the park, Harry Potter and the battle at the Ministry. Your adventure begins as you travel by the flu network from Wizarding Paris straight to the heart of the British Ministry of Magic. You are here for the long-awaited trial of the infamous Dolores Umbridge, you know the Pink Lady. As you step into the Ministry's grand atrium, a marvel in theme park design, take a moment to appreciate this space that seems to go on forever. Soon you board omnidirectional lifts that whisk you to the trial chambers itself. Just as the trial reaches its climax, there's a twist, Umbridge makes a break for it, and chaos erupts. It's up to you to help catch her before the world goes into chaos once again. In a space located between worlds, we'll sit a major roller coaster, Starfall Racers. It's an out and back Mach Rides dueling coaster, reminiscent of the dueling dragons at Islands of Adventure. This trail ride sits in a corridor like space, but perhaps its biggest accomplishment is at the entrance. Here we see a massive trench where the cars will pass by, 
alongside this comet statue in the middle, serving as a focal point. Creating a dynamic space, I recommend you to stop by to enjoy the ambience. The last world we enter is perhaps the most creative one. Here we will be transported into a Viking world, a world where dragons are very much real. Isle of Berg features three main elements, the water where we see Viking boats and the coaster passing through, the grassy hills and landscaping reminiscent of that from the movies, and finally the Viking village. All of these elements combine to recreate the incredible worlds from the franchise. As we enter, we see Mid Hall at the distance. Staged together with boats and large statues, it creates a sense of grandeur and importance. We also see these houses that are quite common in the movies. Since you are seeing them from a distance, they will seem larger, despite their smaller size. The coaster dives near the water, creating a sense of wonder to those watching. Near this, we see the vibrant Viking training camp. While this space might seem minuscule and worthless at first, I recommend stopping by and admiring the creative artwork present. Take a look at the vibrant stylized dragons and how the play structure interacts with the environment. As we advance further into the land, we see Dragon Racers Rally, a dueling flat ride. Huh, <laughs> dragons dueling. Hey! Hey, I've seen this one, I've seen this one, this is a classic! And at the very end, we get the main attraction of the land, Hikapsu Wing Gliders, a family-friendly roller coaster that travels around the land. This ride is not much about the coaster elements, rather about serving as a storytelling device for Isle of Berg. But that's not all, on the side of Mid Hall, we can see another attraction, Fire Drill, a standard water battle boat ride reimagined to fit the world of dragons. Take notice how the different bodies of water transition. It's seamless, you go from the main body of water to this protected body of water that serves the attraction. The two are separated by a bridge, giving the illusion it's all one large body of water. Then the water continues on. But what many are looking forward to is the impressive show. Located at this theater, with a typical geometric shape, will be the star of the park, the untrainable dragon. This show is already present at Universal Studios Beijing and it has been a smash hit. As we dive deeper into the wonders of Epic Universe, let's take a moment to explore where this incredible park is located. Nestled just a short distance from the heart of Universal Orlando Resort, Epic Universe is located near the Orange County Convention Center. In order to accommodate the number of guests traveling between the Universal Parks, a new strode is being built with dedicated bus lanes. And these are the Universal buses that will run between the main resort to the new park. Epic Universe is a creative success, because it combines those elements that made Disneyland in 1955 a success, the connection with recreational parks and world's fairs, and the power of pop culture makes for a truly unique experience we haven't seen for a long time. They say Rome was not built in a day, it took years of hard work, faith, transformation and empirical knowledge to make it the grand city it is today. The same can be said for Epic Universe. It's not a new concept, it's building upon years of grand theme parks and applying this knowledge to create a new, immersive experience with unforgettable lands, stunning design and intricate storytelling. Epic Universe stands poisoned to redefine the world of entertainment. As we look forward to opening day, it's clear, this is just the beginning of Universal's greatest adventure yet.